It's an old truism that there's no such thing as bad publicity. And it's really been more true than in the rise of Pauline Hanson and One Nation. The media have portrayed her as a racist and divisive blight on Australia's body politic, only to see her party win almost a quarter of the vote in last month's Queensland election, and her stocks improve throughout the country. In a perverse way, the media's bias against Pauline Hanson has helped her enormously. It's convinced her frustrated supporters that she's right when she claims Australia's ruling elites don't want to hear about their grievances. They just want to shut her up. In our cover story, Sunday's Ross Coulthard reports on the media's role in the rise of Pauline Hanson. When an elderly gentleman was bashed by protesters for merely attending a Pauline Hanson rally last year, Many Australians who find her policies contemptible nonetheless realised an awful line had been crossed. I just went to get a few facts and I made my own opinion. Dreadful as it was, the event gave many in the media cause to consider how they had covered these often frightening anti-racism demonstrations. How did our unquestioning coverage of exhortations to kill Pauline Hanson sit with the fact that this was meant to be the voice of anti-racist tolerance. Last year we saw a frontal assault on freedom of assembly and freedom of speech in Australia. A lot of people were going to One Nation out of curiosity. They'd heard about it in the media and they were curious. And what a fearful experience that turned out to be. And how did the news media treat this? They treated it with kid gloves. It came and went. They weren't particularly fussed because it was only one nation that was being physically assaulted and intimidated. That was a disgrace. As confronting as the admission may be, it is undeniable that many in the mainstream media have set out to damage Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party because of its implicitly racist and divisive agenda. But in seeking to expose what many suspect is the dark side of Hansenism, have we crossed an ethical line? In our zeal to do the hatchet job, have we subverted the last few remaining threads of credibility we have with much of the Australian public? And worst of all, was the media in part responsible for the rise and rise of Pauline Hanson? The media has created Pauline Hanson. Pauline Hanson can't possibly complain about media about, about the, her coverage in the media. I mean, it has been uh, relentlessly hostile. Uh, she's never been given a fair go. She gets a huge cheer when she says the media is very trying. She gets lots of questions from the floor about why does the media hate you, why are they against you? Now, that's very clever politics of her, because the fact is that when the media attacks her or, or questions her, then the popularity rises. When Pauline Hanson came to this parliament, there was a concerted effort by the media, the political parties, the churches, the press groups to destroy her. All that did was generate uh, public sympathy for, for, for Pauline. Good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen of the press. A year on from last year's violence, if anything, the media pack's hostility to Pauline Hanson and what it believes she represents has hardened. So much so that at this press conference to launch her immigration policy last week, the hatred in the room borne towards the independent member for Oxley from many here was palpable. Hanson had to expect she'd be asked some tough questions about her confronting policies, not least because her new immigration spokeswoman is Robin Spencer 
brought in from the cold extremes of the Australians Against Further Immigration group. Excuse me, the ethnic group leaders are one of the problems of this country. And the, the majority of Media frustrations boiled over when time and time again both women asserted that the official immigration figures were a giant government lie, designed to keep the truth about real immigration levels from the public. The current government doesn't include many people who come into Australia to settle here permanently, legally or illegally, in their figures. Equally frustrating was One Nation's assertion that the immigration policy would be non-discriminatory. No, our policy is non-discriminatory. That wouldn't change. But that is not the reality of what is happening. Well, Spencer particularly made no secret of her desire to protect against what she sees as an undesirable level of ethnic Asian migration. Now, when Dr Charles Price from here in Canberra did his study, he showed that Australia really will be 27% Asian in 23 years. The demographer quoted a Dr Price later said one nation had distorted and misrepresented his research. But the image going out that night to the national audience was that of Pauline Hanson being yelled at yet again by a baying media pack. The whole thing was attack, 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 attack. There was nothing genuine about it. It was a whole bunch of people with an agenda, not a, not a group of professional journalists asking questions. When you were standing on, you were standing to one side looking on, and you almost had a smile on your face. Was there the thought going through your mind that all this is doing is playing to Pauline Hanson's natural constituency? Oh, to a degree, but mostly what I was thinking was that I, I thought the public would enjoy seeing journalists the way they think journalists are. And journalists were not letting the public down. Can I just clarify something? Did you say 70% of the migrants yes. come from yes. Asia? Yes. But that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> and here are the figures. Mm -hmm. Can I just, um, can you please explain to me who you two gentlemen are, please, so I know who I'm talking to? Later that evening, <coughs> One Nation was allowed to win yet another propaganda coup when Immigration Minister Philip Ruddock backed down on an earlier promise to debate Hanson's immigration policy on a current affair, objecting to Spencer's presence. Seems a strange decision, considering John Howard's recent statement that One Nation policies should be subjected to close scrutiny and challenge. Once again, the distorted references to Charles Price were employed. Charles Price, a respected demographer, says it's somewhere... And appeals to official fact, this time from two immigration experts, were swept away by the frustrating One Nation semantic blend of conspiracies, emotion and selective statistics. The more the experts looked smug in the knowledge that they were right, the more David Oldfield looking on knew his leader had won the point. Pauline, you know, th Pauline, why that, do that, they? That's a problem with you. Listen, you have got the policy wrong. No, excuse if you look me, at, if you look it at is the, not. No, you are. You, you don't have an understanding of the policy. All right, we, we, we have, have, have to leave it. We have to leave it there. We thank you in Canberra very much tonight, and we thank you in Melbourne. Thank you. Thank you. Robin Spencer was clearly upset, but Pauline Hanson knew her message had hit the mark with her a current affair audience. But I'd like to get the fact it's OK, we're laying it out on the table. It's up to the Australian people to decide whether... John Pascarelli was Pauline Hanson's advisor until a falling out last year. He accuses the media of trying to destroy Hanson, not just because of what she says, but because we and the political establishment are elitist snobs who hate the sort of person that she is. I think a lot of those people just uh, up themselves. A lot of them are, I think they're snobs in a lot of ways. A lot of, they think they're intellectual snobs. Uh, they're elite. And how dare a person like Pauline Hanson come along, uh, comes along who drops the odd R. And God help us, worked in a fish and chip shop. I mean, the greatest example of new age snobbery was that exhibited by Ho Janet Holmes Accord when she made a sneering reference to that fish and chip shop woman from Queensland. I mean, that again just said Hanson's appeal up again. Of course, it's precisely Pauline Hanson's common touch that helped her win 11 seats in last month's Queensland state election. <laughs> Who could imagine Cheryl Curnow, Carmen Lawrence or Bronwyn Bishop agreeing to do this? You know they're going to say, look what you do to the boss. Do you think it's a class thing with Pauline Hanson? 
Oh, I believe that it is, yes. I think that the, the media definitely see themselves as elitist. They definitely see themselves as some sort of social conscience that must make sure the Australian people see it the way the media see it. Margot Kingston is one of the Sydney Morning Herald's senior political reporters. She admits that initially she and many of her colleagues made a mistake by deliberately not reporting on Hanson in the hope Hanson and her supporters would go away. When the news poll hit two weeks into the Queensland election, we knew we had to work out what was going on here, that um, we'd made a mistake. And I think the mistake we made, certainly say the mistake I made, is I think we all believed that Australia had settled a few things about our identity, about our tolerance, um, and about our place in Asia and in the world. And uh, personally, I mean, I've just got the shock of my life when I went out to Queensland to follow her around and realised that you, you try and have a conversation with a country person about race and there is, a, there is simply not the language to communicate. It is so different, it is just down the line. In the weeks prior to the Queensland poll, it was soon clear that Hanson was not a flash in the pan, but looking at a major victory for one nation. But when Kingston started writing about just what an effective politician Hanson was, many of her colleagues accused her of going soft on the one nation leader. What I was actually doing, shock horror, was um, uh, observational reportage. That's all. And, as, and if that, if as, that's, as distinct from? Well, as distinct from finding the, finding the, the chink and making that the story. For example, the Courier Mail followed her once in the last week of the campaign. They tried to ignore her. Um, they followed her up to North Queensland where every single small town came out to meet her. It was mob scenes. Interesting, weird, um, mind-blowing phenomenon. The Courier Mail ran four pars about how she nearly got killed on the road when um, her driver tried to overtake her. That was it. One obvious example of the media's calculated bias against Hanson was the photos of her used during the campaign. As you look at all the mainstream media's pictures of Pauline Hanson before the Queensland election, and they're all thin-lipped, sour, glowering, every single one of them. After the election, all of a sudden, the smiles the attractive face of Pauline Hanson. Now, it's easiest to find it in the image, but in, in stories, of course, it's happened as well. So why were the media elite doing that? Why do we do that? Well, I think it's because there's a social agenda, which is evil, destructive, and ultimately dangerous for our economy as well. The, the race stuff is intolerable. Now, what the mainstream media wanted, I think what all of... Um, uh, mainstream Australia wanted was for the, the race stuff to be knocked off early. It wasn't. John Howard refused to do it. In fact, he opened the door to it. He said he understood. Now, in my view, and I think the view of many people, I don't know, I don't think I'm elite, but uh, many people who think about Australia for, for a living, race is not something that you allow to flower. I would never want to see Asian immigration stopped because I think that would be politically and socially and emotionally stupid. When John Howard raised his own concerns about the rate of Asian immigration in 1988, many in the media shouted him down as a racist. But I do think it's legitimate to, for any government to worry about the capacity of the community to absorb change and there is some concern about the pace of change involved in the present level of Asian migration. Noted Australian historian Geoffrey Blaney also copped the same epithet for his views. We are building for ourselves long-term troubles if at this stage we do not, as a nation, come to some agreement about the kind of Australia we would like. Whether the media's efforts to knock that race debate on the head was right or wrong, there are those who argue its suppression spawned the seeds of Hansenism a decade on. Pauline Hanson, I think, thinks that she is the message, but she's only just another messenger. There's a lot of people who have gone before her. John Stone, Blaney, Ruxton, Peter Walsh, and of course, Graham Campbell. And Pauline never created this response to her. It's been there all the time. I say it's been there festering away since Whitlam, and it's been bubbling and seething away right up until her maiden speech. And then it all started coming out. Now that's the response. She let the genie out of the bottle. 
This is the Honourable Member's first speech. I ask the House to extend to her the usual courtesies. As you'll see in part two of our story, there's good reason to suspect that the media's efforts to stifle the flames of racism has unwittingly boosted the Hanson bandwagon's ascent to Canberra. I come here not as a polished politician, but as a woman who has her fair share of life's knocks. 